All right, so thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, or maybe nowadays I should say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. Um, let me start off by, by, by uh, resonating with uh, uh, Runio, uh, thanking the organizers for putting this together. QIP is one of the key events uh, that we have in our community and that I can believe we need to keep these communication channels open, even in these difficult times that we have. So um, we really appreciate, I'm very honored to be here and very happy to share with you a little bit about our QM um, and our co-design ideas on how to build quantum computers. So, oh, let me just, all right. Um, so IQM is a quantum computer manufacturer, hardware manufacturer based on subconducting technology. Now, we all know that universal quantum computer is something that's far off into the future. However, at IQM, we believe we can have quantum advantage now. And we want to do this while helping, as, as, as Runia was saying, uh, by, while helping um, the whole ecosystem to grow, but particularly focused in Europe. We are a Finnish uh, and German company. Um, so we want to do that. We want to help Europe have a strong uh, position in this field and technology for sovereignty as well. To do that, the plan is to um, develop our advanced proprietary technology and follow this co-design principle, which will allow us to have application-specific hardware to solve our clients' problems. After that, I'll go into, after introducing with more detail, of course, uh, IQM, I'll go into our core technology and co-design principle and finalize with some of our latest results. So let's get to it. Just a very short brief uh, summary about IQM. We are a spin out of uh, Aalto University and VTT in Finland. Um, we have a team spanning the whole spectrum from hardware manufacturing to the developing the software that will be the quantum software that we're running on this on our machine. Uh, we're very happy to have secured two funding rounds, the, our seed and series A funding rounds already. I'll go into a little bit of, of the numbers uh, in the next slide. And I believe we're in one of the fastest growing companies in the quantum computing sector. Um, we have currently, as I mentioned, two branches, or Andreas had mentioned already, in Finland, our headquarters, and in Germany, Munich. Um, and we currently have a little bit over 80 uh, employees in total. Our history is that um, the company was founded in April 2018 by Jan Götz, Quantan, uh, Mikko Mortonen, and Juha Vartianen. And um, it effectively went into operation a little over a year later after securing its seed funding. After that, things moved rather fast, um, buying our first fridges, setting up our first laboratory environment. And then 2020 was a very busy year um, with the, the branching of IQM to, to Germany, as I mentioned, uh, in March. And then we're very happy to be selected to the EIC Accelerator program in June. Um, and I'm very proud of that because this is an investment that came for the development of quantum computers benefiting the industry and society at large, which really encapsulates uh, what uh, IQM is all about. And then the end of last year, so the last few months, have been rather busy. Um, we have uh, demonstrated on our laboratories uh, the first pieces of our core technology working. And November was a, an incredible month, uh, finalizing our Series A funding and then also being selected to deliver in a tender to deliver uh, Finland's first quantum computer, which is something we're very proud of and I'll get into more detail in, in a few slides. Um, so this is a little bit about our history, but to, to do what we aim to do, we need a strong R&D. Most of our um, hardware efforts are currently located in, in, in Espo. It's a neighboring city, three kilometers away, I believe, uh, from Helsinki in Finland. Uh, we currently have three dilution refrigerators installed, five more planned for the first half of this year. And this is all in a very nice uh, electromagnetically shielded underground facility. We're very happy to be able to use Micronova's clean rooms uh, to fabricate our devices. These are the largest clean rooms um, in, the, in the Nordics. And I have to say, I, I really like those pictures here. Um, I haven't, unfortunately, since I joined the company, um, COVID has been around, so I haven't been able to get myself to Finland. I'm based in Munich, but I really look forward to going there and seeing all of this in action and, uh, and the amazing Finnish uh, landscape. We also have some uh, experimental efforts developing in Germany, so stay tuned because you're going to be hearing more about us uh, and our German, um, German news uh, in the near future. 
So um, as I told you, we were selected, we're very happy to have been selected to deliver Finland's first quantum computer. Now, this is an incredible opportunity and it also shows what I mentioned to you in the beginning. This is really about partnerships. This is a project that we're delivering um, to VTT in Finland, working with them for the delivery, but we're also working with Aalto University in Finland, ETH Zurich in Switzerland, uh, Ulysses Research Center in Germany. So this is really an European project to deliver this uh, first quantum computer for Finland. Um, and we're also working in close collaboration with CSC in Finland and Atos in France. And the idea here is that we're going to develop, to be delivering uh, two VTT A5, and then a 20, and then a 50 qubit processor uh, that, that they're going to be deployed in the next three and a half years. Of course, if we want to achieve all of that, we need strong R&D. And as I told you in the beginning, we really span from in the whole spectrum of, of research that can be done there uh, in the field, starting from fabrication, where our fabrication team manufactures uh, our processors and then brings them to the system integration team, which is responsible for taking them into operation. And they have a very neat weekly feedback cycle uh, with getting the chips, cooling them down, benchmarking them, giving feedback to the fabrication team, new devices are prepared, sent to the system integration and so on. And of course, we want to do this not looking at today, right? We don't, we don't want to have tens of qubits. We want to really be looking at the future where we have thousands, several thousands of qubits in our chips. And that means that a lot of what we need, a lot of the components we need are not off the shelf things that we can just buy. So we have an in-house scalable electronics team, which is working on the control equipment for our processors. Um, and we also have a software team that's working on the classical software solutions for this control. So this really uh, is a huge effort and on the, on the highest level of abstraction here, you have the co-design team, which is essentially the, the team in Munich uh, where I'm based. And our goal is to develop application specific algorithms, but co-designing the processor that's going to be running those algorithms with the hardware team. So it's really a joint effort about, uh, amongst all of us I believe we are one of the world's largest quantum hardware engineering teams. We have currently some 50 plus um, quantum engineers um, across these two, uh, these two offices in, in Finland and Germany. So this is all, uh, this, is, this is really IQM what I just showed you. It's, it's a joint effort spanning the whole uh, spectrum. It's a collaborative effort with uh, Europe and um, other partners to develop our quantum computers. Now, let me get into a little bit of detail about our core tech and this co-design idea. Now, if I just put it simply, we can separate our core tech as um, development of, of, uh, of uh, new ideas, new protocols, and new, and new chip elements to increase the clock speed of our quantum computers, and thus giving us a fast lane to quantum advantage. And then on the co-design idea, the co-design is really, as I mentioned just now, the idea that we're going to match the problem that we're trying to solve to software, to quantum software, and to the hardware, all in tandem, trying to um, work out the, the, the best solution to our, to our clients' needs, and thus getting us quantum advantage rather uh, sooner than later. So I'm going to break this down into two parts. I'm going to first now give you a, a high level, rather high level explanation of what our core tech is. Towards the end of the talk, I hope I have time. Um, I will give you more details about it. Now, um, as I mentioned to you, the idea is that we reduce or increase the clock speed, or uh, if you prefer, we reduce the clock cycle time um, of our quantum computers. And the way we see this is that we need to reduce gate times, we need to reduce uh, readout and reset times. All of those things, those, those are the, the things that we are working on right now. And the high level description of what we're doing is for the faster reset time, we're using something called a quantum circuit refrigerator, or QCR for short. And this is a very neat piece of equipment of, 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 of it's a small uh, chip element that when coupled to whatever it is that you want to, to reset, let's say a qubit, it acts like an effective reservoir for that qubit, a very cold temperature effective reservoir, but one which you can tune very fastly um, the decay rates of your qubit into this reservoir. 
What that means is that you can go from a regime where the, this QCR has effectively no influence on your device, on your qubit, to a regime where you have very quick um, decay rates, very fast decay rates, and does very quick reset. And one of the nicest things here is that this is a reservoir, right? Which means um, for those that, that, that are um, more technically advanced without me giving details, this means it's unconditional to the state of your system. It doesn't matter the state of your qubit, it's going to be reset to the ground state. And it actually doesn't matter even if, you're, um, if you had leakage errors and your excitation is now in the second, third, fourth excited states, these are all going to be reset to, um, to, the, to the ground state. Next, we have the faster readout. Faster readout uses a very simple and neat scheme um, for multi-channel driving uh, of a resonator treat your, your qubit. So this is, in essence, very different in spirit, very different from uh, what one does in the usual uh, off resonance regime of readout. But it turns out that by using that, we can reduce significantly the time uh, of readout while you're having high fidelity. And I guess, actually, the most crucial thing here is that there's no on-chip overhead. If you want to think about overhead, the only overhead you have really is on the scale of electronics, which needs to be able to send this, this driving scheme into your chip, which really uh, is not something we expect to be an issue. So it's really, the, the chip doesn't have anything new. There's no complexity that you have to input um, to get this faster readout. And then finally, for the faster grades, we're using tunable couplers. Tunable couplers are widespread. Um, several companies um, use them, several uh, academic research groups use them especially in the subconducting community, but we are pairing them with um, a new type of, let me call them N-junction qubits, which we're developing, which gives us a nonlinearity in the coupling, which can then be used to get very fast resets. And um, this really, these three layers here that I just described really um, tell you what the core tech that we're developing at IQM is. Um, and, this, and this is the core tech that I believe put us, or uh, or we are confident puts us in this fast lane to quantum advantage because essentially it reduces our um, by reducing the clock cycle we reduce our sensitivity to information loss and by doing that we reduce our requirements for error correction now let's take a moment let's let, let's breathe a little bit uh, especially me uh, maybe i'll get some water because i want to get you now to discuss co-design and co-design is really um, the point where people scratch their heads a little bit more um, because we're essentially not used to this. It's, it's, Co-design is in itself not new. Um, it has been used in several industries already, but for us in the quantum field, it's rather new. So I'm gonna take a moment uh, for us to go slowly here and uh, just get you to understand the general idea of, that we have. And do notice that I said that we have because I really want to stress how IQM sees core design. All right, so to do that, let's actually first start with standard gate-based quantum computing. How does one go about building this? Uh, well, you start with qubits, right? You create your qubits in your laboratory or you isolate your qubits, whatever physical platform you're using. You manage to control, operate on them. You're satisfied with everything you're doing. You call them qubits, great. Next step is you place a bunch of them together coupled. Of course, you start with two, then three, and so on. But in essence, you build a grid out of that uh, system that you have. And here I've written square lattice, but you really shouldn't worry about that. It's just some connectivity graph that your system uh, is, is, is based on. So if you have a linear ion trap, that's going to be just a line. So no square lattice there, um, no, no two dimensionals even, and so on, right? Uh, square lattice may be more uh, suitable for superconducting qubits, but not for all platforms. Point being, you have your qubits and they are set there and they have some kind of connectivity. Once you have them and all your single and two qubit operations are working well, the next step you do is you build logical gates. You operate with quantum error correction on your, on your uh, qubits to build logical qubits. Once you have several of those logical qubits put together, you can finally do your digital quantum computing. Now, Co-design is not going to throw any of those away. These are brilliant ideas. We just want to enlarge our toolbox. 
So the idea of digital gate-based quantum computing is that you have this, what I just described, some version of this, and then you take whatever problem you're trying to solve and you map, you map that problem into your device. Co-design wants to flip that around and actually map, map the hardware and quantum software into the problem you're trying to solve. And the way we see this is um, we see this in three different layers. Now, those are three different layers of abstraction, not complexity. You can think of them independently, um, but those are three different ways for us to approach how to enlarge our toolbox. And the first one, which we call co-design level one, is the idea that instead of, as in digital uh, computing, just use single and two cubic gates, we're going to allow ourselves to use something we call analog blocks. Now, analog blocks are nothing more than multi-qubit entangling gates. That means that more than two qubits will be uh, interacting simultaneously. It may be just the case that all of the qubits in your system are going to be having simultaneous interaction in them. It may be that this is going to be separated into blocks. It doesn't really matter. It really depends on the problem that you're trying to solve. That's really a, a part of the core message here. And the idea behind using those is something called digital analog quantum computing, which I'll explain briefly in the next slide, which has been that this is a new paradigm that has proven to be um, very interesting and robust to noise. So for the NISC era, it makes sense to look into it. Co-design level two is the idea that, well, we also don't need to just look at, again, I'm calling them square lattice, but whatever connectivity graph is natural for your system. We can also experiment with other things and subcondition qubits are very good uh, at allowing us to do that. So maybe our problem fits best to some triangular lattice. Maybe it fits better to a, an irregular connectivity. We're going to really look into what fits best our problem. And then the co-design level three is the idea that, well, we also don't necessarily need to use qubits. Maybe it's interesting to use three level system, five level systems or bosonic modes. If my problem has as part of the computational units there, a bosonic system, why would I actually have to encode that into qubits? I can just build a bosonic mode in my device. Of course, all of this explanation, which I really like, it really encapsulates what, how we see core design, has to be um, using the basis that our hardware team can do. We're not going to go there and say, Let, let's create something crazy. No, no. We need to be in contact, contact with them. We need to know what is, is, is what are the things that are manageable in the, the experiment so that we can propose experiments that are feasible. Now, this is really an abstract description. Let me go into a little bit of how this could work. At IQM, we are focused at three main um, applications, which are finance, chemistry, and machine learning. So this in, internally, that's uh, what we are uh, working uh, towards. Now, suppose a client comes to us and says, look, I have this financial problem. It's computation intense, and I want to have quantum advantage. At IQN, what we're going to do is we're going to very often, uh, including the, 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 the client or the partner, we're going to study the mathematical structure of that problem and then map it to a chip layout which is optimized to solve that specific problem. And this mapping may also, as I mentioned, include non-qubit elements if those are suited for the problem. And then on top of that, the kind of algorithm that we're going to look into, well, we're very interested in digital analog quantum computing. This approach essentially can be uh, well described by this, uh, by this graph here. You have a sequence of gates, uh, this dark and this light gray boxes. The light gray are simply single qubit rotations, okay? So just that. And the dark gray, which uh, here I call resource interaction, but to keep the notation clear, those are the analog blocks I mentioned in the previous slide. So this here would be this multi-qubit entangling operations. Again, as I mentioned, it how they are going to work really depends on the problem you're trying to solve, but you're going to have your full algorithm is going to be a sequence of analog blocks, single qubit rotations, analog blocks, single qubit rotation, analog blocks, single qubit rotations, and so on. And of course, for us, as I just mentioned, for us to know that this is doable, we need to be in constant contact with our, our the algorithm designers, it needs to be in constant contact with the experimental teams, and oftentimes including the user, um, for us to create this, which as a final product is an optimized chip and algorithm 
designed in tandem to meet the, our user needs. And just to give you a small hint, small flavor of the kind of thing we're thinking about, chemistry naturally is a strong candidate for applications of quantum. So we're looking at studying dynamic and static properties of molecules and, and, and materials, electron transport problems, and so on. And we already have very promising results telling us that uh, encoding the problems that we're looking into in non-qubit element units can bring advantage as well as uh, not using regular square lattices. And those are really um, good signs for us that we're going to the right, the right direction um, with this co-design approach, which really, really, as I said, the way I like to see it, really, instead of matching the problem to the hardware we have, we just flip this around and try to create a hardware that, match, that best matches the, the problem. By doing that, we are confident that we're going to reduce the requirements that our quantum computer has, and thus, um, or sorry, we're going to simplify the, we're going to diminish the complexity of our circuit, which then puts us in a great advantage to achieve quantum advantage. Um, all right, so let me take the last few minutes uh, and just guide you through uh, some of our latest results. Um, this is going to be still a high level description also because we don't have a lot of time, um, but I think it gives you some flavor for those that uh, are more familiar with these devices. So let me start off with uh, the faster reset I mentioned before. This, as I said, uses something called a quantum circuit refrigerator or QCR. Um, and it, in essence, it's a subconducting insulator, normal metal insulator subconducting junction. And then you couple, let's say a qubit you want to reset to the normal metal. And by applying a voltage across this junction, you can control, this is what's shown in this graph, you can control by orders of magnitude the decay rate um, of your qubit into this effective uh, environment, effective very cold environment. So you can go from decay rates that are very low, which essentially means your qubit is not coupled to that system, to the QCR, to very fast decay rates, which then allow us to have faster reset um, than usually. And we've managed to implement that, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, um, in our lab towards the end of last year. Uh, so we have shown the faster reset using the QCR with a reasonable fidelity. Of course, we're working on improving those numbers. This was really the first implementation we had. Um, the next part was the faster readout. This is still ongoing work, uh, but we are working on implementing this multi-channel uh, driving scheme that I mentioned to you before. The, the readout scheme that we currently have has a fidelity readout, a readout fidelity, sorry, um, of 94%. And we hope to soon be able to, to share with you uh, data on, the, on this, this multi-channel driving scheme I mentioned. And finally, the Control Z gate is something that came just before Christmas. It was a the Christmas present that we got from the, the hardware team. Um, here, uh, we've used uh, Xmons to perform this, uh, this Control Z gate using a tunable coupler, but in a specific way where we can use the nonlinearity um, of the coupling uh, system to get gate times of 20 nanoseconds and a fidelity of 96% really in our one of our first um, implementations of this. So this is really promising results, especially given the time that, uh, uh, that the team managed to pull this, uh, pull this out. So we're very happy about it. And our, as our next steps, what we're going to do is we're going to be taking um, our five qubit chip into operation. This is then a chip that's going to be delivered after benchmarking and being satisfied with the quality, it's going to be delivered to VTT um, as part of the Finnish quantum computer uh, project. And we're very looking forward to uh, executing digital analog quantum algorithms, which we are, uh, which we expect to be very uh, helpful on these um, devices. So thank you very much for tuning in. And let me just wrap up uh, telling you that we are hiring both in the Finnish and in the, in the German office. So if you're interested, please visit our website. And of course, feel free to contact me if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk, Bruno. Um, okay, let's see if we have questions. Um, yes, yeah, I can, I can, 
I, I actually eventually just now something arrived in this lecture. Um, uh, so Ernesto Galvao asks, uh, is IQM solely focused on uh, NISC applications or is there also a parallel drive to actually implement uh, error corrected qubits in the longer term? Um, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, definitely, yes. The plan is to have um, in the longer term Move, move toward uh, full-fledged quantum computer, um, meaning error-corrected universal quantum computer. Um, and this is one of the very important reasons of, to develop this core technology that we're working for, that we're working towards. Um, however, whether those are going to, whether we're going to get there, um, so maybe I should say, before we get there, we're confident we're, that we're going to be having this co-design approach uh, delivering advantage now and for the next several years i'm not going to to, to guess a number here before uh, any of us any of our uh, any of us in the community is able to get to to full-fledged quantum computer thanks for the question uh, yeah indeed i mean i was uh, i was to prepare myself a little bit for the chairing i i, I was uh, going through the iqm website to see a little bit what the plan is and i saw that you are i mean as a midterm goal uh, it's kind of mentioned, okay, the, the aim is by the next few years to arrive to a 50 qubit device. And uh, in fact, uh, my question goes kind of in the same direction, but with a slightly different action. I mean, 50 qubit, that's what Google and IBM are demonstrated recently. So what the, what, where we are now in, in sort of internationally, what is what what do you think your device will do differently? I mean, where, where do you think you will, you will uh, be better than than the than the existing these kind of NISC uh, devices. Uh, right. So this, um, I think it's important to put things in perspective. You, you're absolutely right that our plan, as I mentioned in the beginning, is that in the next three and a half years we'll be delivering this 50 qubit chips to BTT. Um, so this, uh, I'm not um, I'm not an expert in, in this in the, in the planning in the company. Uh, maybe I get something off, but uh, the idea is that in this, in this time span, we're going to be delivering, we're going to be reaching this 550 qubit fully operating system. Um, but the point here is really that um, most other uh, people working on this field, other companies working on this field are really taking, taking the approach of building the, the quantum computer, the universal quantum computer. So they're really following their, the roadmap is towards that. And that means that um, they're not optimizing the problem, the, their hardware to solve a specific problem. Mm. And that's a very different thing from what we're doing. We're developing the tech so that we can have the, the, the image that I showed there was of Lego pieces, because we really think of this like that. We, we develop the technology, we develop the individual pieces, and then we take the problem that uh, our clients bring to us, and we take all the toolbox that we have, the Lego pieces that we do have, and then we assemble them in the better way to solve their, their problem. And that reduces the complexity greatly. Just a very simple yeah, example is a bosonic good. mode, really, because you don't have, we can use a cavity um, to do that instead of having to encode that into qubits, which may be very costly. I mean, of course, the real world is not that flexible. I mean, we can, we can only do the things that, are, that we can do. I mean, there's, yes. like, it's, not, it's not like we can just invent our, our platform. So I was, I, I, maybe I can uh, lose, use the last moment to voice Davide Ferrari's question about this co-design, which I guess many of us are not that familiar. So is that really a, so what he says is, is that really a reversed approach where you take the problem and you try to kind of just build the ideal hardware for that? Or is it more sort of something in the middle that you sort of it, work it, It's definitely, it's definitely something in the middle because as you said, we have several limitations on our hardware. So uh, we don't expect that we're simply going to be able to map a problem into a hardware that we can actually do, that we can manufacture, operate on. Um, so what we need to do with the work is to find a middle ground solution. Um, and how is that going to, to, to look really depends on the problem that we're trying to solve. So um, I don't think I can give you any definite answer on that. Good. Thank you very much. I mean, the time is exactly 11.30. So maybe that's a good moment to thank uh, Bruno again for the talk. Uh,